Hey, it's 5.35 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 4 in the supposed year of 2017. And to the gatekeepers, purveyors of fear porn, silent consenters, and gimme, gimme Christians, greetings. To all else, hello. It's good to be with you again. I'm going to try to wrap up John Truman Wolf's Anatomy of a Con Job. I tried the last video, but it didn't work out. Uh, that was a long section. And as most of you know, I, I don't get through any of my readings without a decent amount of commentary. I'm not here solely as a narrator. Although, if I had more time, I think I would narrate more literary works uh, without commentary because there's so many good ones out there to listen to and absorb and think on that I know a lot of us in our busy lives would probably take advantage of. I I do have at this point in time at least one, if not, well, no, no two YouTube channels on my favorites that are, or subscriptions that are dedicated solely to presenting narrated books. One of them has a wide variety of books. Um, you can find anything from early non-fictional works. You can get the U.S. Constitution read to you, and things like that. All the way up to, they, they also have fictional works, so it can become kind of a jungle um, scrolling through all the different books they have on there. Uh, another site I have is uh, readings of the books of the Bible. Now, thus far, I've only been able to find complete readings of the books of the Bible in King James Version, New International Version, and I've, I've actually found one in, um, <clears throat> oh gosh, it would be, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, the real popular paraphrase that's out there today. Is it the, uh, is it the living, is it the living Bible? Is that what it is? That, the, the real, it's a, it is a very popular paraphrase these days. And I want to say it is the living Bible. But you can correct me if I'm wrong. I could probably find out actually because, um, yeah, Bible Hub right here has about the top 25 um, going around. So we've got uh, Darby Dewey, English Revised, God's Word, Holman, uh, JPS Tanakh, Jubilee, King James. Not American Standard. Yeah, it the New Living Translation. So yeah, I found it. I uh, believe all of the books of uh, the Bible in the Tanakh and the New Testament uh, in New Living Translation on YouTube. And um, I'm going to be, I would say from here on out, I'm going when I say Tanakh, I mean all of the books that make up what we have commonly called the Old Testament. I don't like the term the Old Testament. I don't like the term the Old Testament because in the New Testament, none of the people writing it referred to it as the Old Testament. They referred to it all as the Scriptures. And to call it the Old Testament, I think, is deliberate to make it seem like it's antiquated, or it doesn't matter. And that is not true. It all matters. It all matters if, if we pay attention to the words of Jesus Christ himself. He said, Do not think I came to abolish the law. I did not. I did not come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. Not one nor jot nor tittle will pass away from the law until heaven and earth should pass away. So we have one Bible. 
that Bible records God's creation of everything, heaven, earth, the seas, and all there is in them, man, and then woman from man, their temptation and fall through the deception of Satan. And since the Father, Yahweh, his long-term plan to redeem his people. Again, I'm also going to be referring to, for instance, um, those patriarchs uh, we see in the Tanakh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, and others of the faith since them as our ancestors. Because if you are in Christ, you are are of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are Israel. You are the children of the living God. So, the Bible is our history book. It is also our map of the times, what has happened in this world since Christ came, died, and was raised again unto eternal life, the first fruits of the dead. And we should not look at it like it is something detached from us. If you are in Christ, by grace through faith, those people that you're reading about, those are your ancestors. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what nationality you are. I don't care if your um, eyes are slanted. I don't care if your skin is pink and rosy or, or black and your hair is nappy. I don't care what language you speak. I don't care what, you know, um, because it doesn't matter if you're in Christ. Those people spoken of, the patriarchs, those are your ancestors. The Bible is a history book of your people. So, for these reasons, <clears throat> I refuse to call the, uh, the Bible from Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament. It is the Tanakh. It is all the scriptures up until the coming of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah, the only begotten Son of the Father, Yahweh. Now, In my reading of um, part five of Anatomy of a Con Job, and thinking about these carbon taxes and, and everything before that, because um, Wolf is going to get into, well, the section's called The Solutions, and we'll see what his solutions are, but in thinking about these things, these cons, these deceptions, you have to ask yourself some, I think, pretty rudimentary questions. One of them being, why the deception? Why the con? You see, Back when, I mean, we could, we could just literally say from the time of the rise of um, Imperial Rome, and I want to say that because it was pretty much Imperial Rome or becoming Imperial Rome by the time they had went and, and occupied 
uh, Judea. Oh gosh, it was um, 70s-ish uh, BC. Yeah, I would say about that time. From the time of the rise of Imperial Rome. Um, up until uh, just, I want to say post-Reformation. And um, it, t it took a few hundred years. Because there was... there. <sighs> And I know that we, we, we tend to attribute the Reformation to Martin Luther's 95 thesis on uh, October 31st, November 1st, uh, 1517. That's kind of like the, uh, it's sort of like ground zero for the Reformation. So we'll, for now, we'll talk about the Reformation like, like that, like as if it was. Because a lot of things happened from from that time forward um throughout uh the known world so from that time on it took a couple more centuries before uh america rose up um more and more as a as a free nation and uh even that i don't want to go too much into the rise of america and especially its uh its manifest destiny its uh its dealings with the natives here and how much catholic doctrine had to do with the uh very unsavory dealings with the indigenous population of the Americas. I know that's that's continually put on uh, white Protestants, but that, that was not the case. The, the way that they were dealt with, um, murdered, lied to, land stolen, given disease, that was all Catholic doctrine. Because they considered them as, well, like George Orwell might say, unpersons. They didn't consider them people because of their doctrine of dominion. Those, those people who are unconverted, they don't consider them as people, men, living souls. But anyways, I digress from that. So, up until just a couple hundred years ago, The world was run in a pretty simple way. I'm not saying there were not deceptions. You know, the aristocracy of any age has always been deceptive. Um, in fact, it was just from the time of the Reformation forward, little by little, more and more increasingly, that... Uh, those members of the aristocracy, in, including um, everyone over at the Vatican, uh, the doors were open more and more um, into their secret chambers, and they had to retreat more and more into uh, darker, more secret places. So I'm not saying that there wasn't secrets, uh, before now, or deceptions before now. But I'm saying, in general, the way the world was run, um, and when I say the world, I, I mean it centralized mostly in around Europe, the papacy, and the quote-unquote Holy Roman Empire. Now, I'm not saying that to leave the um, other nations out. Um, they do have their own histories, and all of their histories have been influenced um, by the nations and the peoples that we are going to talk about. You have to remember, um, many uh, traditions concerning the uh, apostles of Jesus Christ record that 
they went into many different countries. Um, it's said that Andrew went up uh, around Russia, and that um, I believe it was uh, Philip and one other uh, were down in around India, and then um, Paul all over Asia Minor. And I think there's a very good reason why, and, and, and the rest of them dispersed as well. And they made disciples, and they dispersed. There are records that I believe, again, are suppressed because they don't want us to know history, real, true history. I believe there were missionaries coming to the Americas from the first couple of centuries after Christ came first in the flesh. It's recorded that, um, <clears throat> was it now Patrick of Ireland? Was it him? Am I thinking of the right man who it is said was coming to the Americas as early as, what, was it as early as the 4th or 5th century? Because we do know that there were um, Christian settlements, very advanced, very literate Christian settlements in Ireland as early as the 4th century. So, I mean, think about how much history has been hidden. The history of our world. The history of our people. Us being Christians. Our people being in the Tanakh. All those who were faithful Israelites. And in the New Testament, all those who are in Christ, who are then counted as Israelites. The history of our people has been deliberately covered up. But in general, you had the Pope in Rome, and he had full spiritual and temporal power for most of this time, ever since he was given the keys of temporal power. And by that time, he pretty much had the spiritual power as well. So they didn't really have to employ many deceptions necessarily, and by the time that they sank the world into its dark ages, I don't think it was that hard to deceive anyone. They just kept their business to themselves. And that was that. But today, today, they have to employ a lot more deception. And there's, there's good reasons for that. Uh, <clears throat> I think the idea of an American nation has been a thorn in the side of Rome since its inception, since so many people fled to the Americas, and specifically North America, but the Americas in the centuries after what we would call the Reformation, or Reformation Day. It has been a thorn in their side, and because of the mentality of those people who fled here and who built a life here, who built communities here of people who believed the Bible and lived it, and there were many, since that time and 
Rome having lost so much overt um, strength and control, there had to be employed a certain degree of deception. And we can see that in a number of the people that we call the founding fathers of the United States. They were agents, deceivers, and they had a large population of people who were not about to live under that murderous shadow of Rome anymore, like they and their immediate ancestors had across the sea. So they had to employ deception. And they have had to continue to employ that deception. For the last couple hundred years, and now since the end of World War II, and uh, we're going on close to a century now, because of the inception of the CIA and a lot of very immoral actions that this country has taken in the early part of the 20th century that the people allowed, they went along with, because of their own selfishness. We are now in a state of what many people now call the deep state, where this government and then <clears throat> by design this government um, running the other governments of the world, this government being run by another shadow government which was conceived right after the Reformation in the 1500s called the Counter-Reformation, it continues to employ deception, specifically on the population of this country, the United States of America. And so you got to ask yourself, well, it, if it was not needed so much in the past, why, why today is everything a deception? Why did... Why does John Truman Wolf write this this long paper, Anatomy of a Con Job, where he's exposing these cons? He's showing us the junk science involved. Um, he's showing us um, how this works to the advantage of the elitists um, that are are running things. So, why the need for it? And this again factors right into what I've I've said before about the people who are the purveyors of fear porn, uh, constantly talking about the um, horrific. Uh, thing that's going to happen uh, to the United States and its population almost always perpetrated by agents of Satan uh, whether, whether it be coming from Rome and any one of its tentacles or uh, Israel, Zionism, the Illuminati, space aliens um, from within, civil wars, race wars the president, he's building a wall, not to keep Mexicans out, but to keep Americans in. All of these things they say, and of course, uh, down to the um, the core, um, they're always saying, and, and, that, and that coming from Satan himself. So in response to the fear porn mongers, I'm afraid I just don't, I don't agree with that. This nation has had to have been subdued through subversion, deception, confusion, 
cons. The people of this nation have had to have been conned. Um, if you want to keep a population subdued, and these kind of people, they want to keep this population subdued, and I, I want to, to make a clear distinction and contrast to the population of the United States of America. Uh, to every other world and show you why so much deception is employed by these, uh, well, this deep state against the American people. And why it doesn't need to be employed in other countries so much and why it didn't really need to be employed um before the, the, the inception and, and foundation of the United States. Okay, so these numbers that I'm going to give, they were not taken from a single source nor a single survey because I've found oftentimes that polls can be skewed. Oftentimes their results are skewed to push a certain agenda or idea. So I had to go and check multiple sources on all of these things before... I began talking about them. So, let's get into the population of the United States of America. It is somewhere around 320 million. That would be pretty much total population. In constant fluctuation, but that's your average, about 320 million. Okay. So, out of that 320 million... It is uh, a pretty safe assumption that there are anywhere between uh, the late 200s to the very, very early 300 million guns on record. Civilian. We're not talking about military. We're not talking about police or anything like that. We're talking about citizens, civilians. Okay? There's somewhere between 270 to 300... 10 million civilian guns in the United States. That's on record. Okay, so that doesn't count all the ones that are not recorded. Um, you know, the NRA says that somewhere around uh, 40% <clears throat> of Americans uh, own guns. Um, Pew Research and others uh, put it somewhere more around 31%. But um, after looking at all of the different polls and the data and everything, I'd say it's a safe bet to say somewhere around one-third of all Americans who were um, honest and said that they own guns, one-third um, own guns. And based on the amount of civilian guns they say out there, that, that basically puts it around two guns to three guns per gun owner. Okay, so what that means is that in the United States of America, there should be, based on all the figures put together, there should be just over 100 million civilian gun owners with two to maybe three guns per gun owner. Again, 100 million citizens with guns. Of various types. Okay, now I want to put that in perspective. The three largest armies in the world have as active military one China, 2.3 million active military, the US, 1.5 million active military, and India, 1.3 active. 1.3 million active military. If I were to take the 24 largest militaries in the world combined, they would have, and I'm leaving out the U.S., they would have 14 million active soldiers. Now I'm going to repeat. There are one hundred million armed U.S. 
citizens with about two plus guns per armed citizen. One hundred million. The top 24 armies in the world combined have 14 million soldiers. So you think <clears throat> that is if you took all of the American citizens who are armed combined that is an army that is six to seven times the size of the 24 largest militaries in the world combined. This is why all the deception. When you have, when you have a gigantic, dangerous beast, you can't just order it around. You have to, through subtlety, lead it. Nothing happens in the U.S. No foreign war campaign is waged. No atrocity is committed without the consent of the American people. That needs to sink in. None of this is done without the consent of the American people. And you can say, well, you know, we didn't... Uh, we, we didn't order our politicians to go into some country and, and wage an unrighteous, unjust, murderous, despicable war. Yeah, but you allowed it. What, what is our military full of? It's full of our sons and our daughters. Consider that. Consider that all the registered gun owners in America equal an army seven times the size of the top 24 nations' armies put together. All the things that happen happen by consent of the American population. It happens by consent. Because these things wouldn't happen. These leaders wouldn't do the despicable things that they do without our consent. That's just a fact. So, nobody gets to say, what could I do about it? Because with that many citizens, with that much power, to where they have to lead us by deception, it should tell, it should tell anyone that the power lies in the people. And everything done, no matter how atrocious, is done with the consent of the people. I know that they have uh, many despicable evil laws have been passed here and abroad and many evil and despicable actions have been done here and abroad. But no leader is installed lest the people consent. If that one-third of Americans that I've been talking about decided they were not going to consent 
believe me, these things would not happen. They would not happen. This is why these cons have to be used. It's why these deceptions have to be employed. And the thought of the fear porn mongers that they're just going to uh, come in and decimate the population of the United States or whatever else is I think it's a bit infantile because they're not considering the effect <clears throat> that the United States um, with the consent of the governed and the strength of its military has on the world market. Yeah, they have been doing a lot of things uh, against the people of this country, the U.S., um, in the sense of uh, inflation, which is theft. Inflation is theft. To decrease the value of your money is theft. Um, they have silently, uh, in a very uh, sneaky way, they have enslaved us. This is true. Um, the amount of uh, unrighteous, unfair taxes are, are amazing. It, no one who was around during um, this country's constitutional foundation would have ever put up with the types of taxation we have today. The power of the bank, the uh, influence of the corporation, the, the amount that um, government institutions um, are into uh, the business of uh, utilities and other things that are considered as day-to-day uh, -day necessities. They're cleaning up. It's, as I said last time, it is a big mafia. It is a big syndicate. It's all criminals uh, committing crimes against not only the, the citizens of this country, but, but abroad. And they would not be able to do it if it, not, or if it weren't for the consent of the people of this country. <clears throat> and they'll, they'll continue to kill the people of this country through diseases, uh, drug addiction, drug overdose, abortion, vaccines, um, suicide, uh, being suicided, um, and all kinds of things. They will continue to do that as long as we consent to their control. And not only that, they will continue to do it worldwide in a much more overt way. You know, since, since World War II, it is on record, <clears throat> and I don't believe these numbers. I think these numbers ought to be way higher. It's on record that 20 to 30 million people worldwide are dead from our foreign wars since World War II, and I think that number is very low. I don't believe that number. I believe that number should be far, far, far higher than that. Um, about 65 million legal U.S. abortions have been performed since Roe v. Wade in 1973. Drug overdoses just in the USA, heroin and others, they say a half million lives have been lost in the last 15 years, and I think that figure is low, too. Uh, we go worldwide, unimpeded, and 
we murder decent leaders when they threaten the petrodollar. Um, I mean, who, who raised their voices and complained or was outraged uh, over Muammar Gaddafi's sickening murder that was perpetrated? Who really dug into that to find out what kind of a leader Gaddafi was? and what he did for his citizens and why the leaders of this country sent in Al-Qaeda and caused such civil unrest in that country and then eventually murdered him because he threatened the petrodollar. It happens again and again around the world. When some leader of a nation wants to do right by their citizenry, and in order to do that, they have to challenge this beast, the United States. And so many of them have been good to their citizens. Whatever else you want to say about them, I suppose their spiritual beliefs or, you know, their personal lifestyles and whatnot, many of them far better to their citizens than the leaders of this country or the other quote-unquote civilized countries of the world are to theirs. And we go and we take them out and we disrupt the, um, the government, the citizens, and we lower the standard of living for the peoples of those countries. Um, and, you know, I have to wonder, you know, how many people in the United States go to sleep every night in safety, in comfort, in warmth, with a full belly, and how many peoples of so many countries throughout the world can't because of us, our actions worldwide. And we people, we will not be held unaccountable for this. Because if we wanted to stop these wars these injustices and atrocities, we have the power to, and we don't. We're lazy, lazy, selfish babies. Greedy, self-indulgent, gimme, gimme, gimme. It's why Christianity in this country, if you can call it that, looks the way it does. It's why most of the shepherds of the church in this country are bought and paid for by 501c3 benefits. Why they don't speak out on all of this ad nauseum. Bought and paid for. <clears throat> So recently, um, I was reading in Jeremiah, and I, I'm not going to read it now because it would make this so extremely, extremely long. But if you go to Jeremiah and read Jeremiah chapter 22, and then read the following chapter, 23, and consider it like a uh, sort of a cause and effect. Um what is said about the people in 22 and then what is said about their leaders in 23 and um and then consider that um paul says in 1 corinthians 10 11 
Uh, now all these things happened to them by way of example. And they were written for our admonition, on whom the ends of the ages have come. Because we can't just continue, we can't just continue to allow such evil to happen and say, well, it's not for us to, to deal with, to wrestle with these things. It's not for us. Then I say, then who is it for? If it is not our responsibility to bring goodness and justice and righteousness into this world, and I'm not talking about dominion theology. I'm not talking about the church taking over the world. I'm not talking about Catholic dominion theology. I'm talking about justice and goodness and equity. And when it's our in it when it is in our hands to do something to establish and perpetuate justice and equity. And while there is still day and we can still work, then it is our responsibility to do something. 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 And I know that most of us, we're living lives where I know we're kept very busy because we're enslaved. We're, we're enslaved. A free man does not have to put as much time into taking care of all the bills that we have. Yes, it's true. They have made it to where a man can just barely take care of his family and oftentimes cannot. They have designed this. But the last thing that's going to help a situation like that is all of the civil unrest for one thing. Black against white, or white against black, or both against Mexicans or anyone else. That's not going to that's not going to help anything. And we are in quite a pickle. I'll give you that. We are. We are. But the time for laziness and sleep has got to be over. It's got to be done. We can't have that anymore. Our country and because of our country's influence on the rest of the world, the world has become such a dark place in the past century. When for a while there, there was a lot of goodness in the world where it could be had, and it was there because responsible righteous Christian people exercise their responsibility to bring justice and equity into any place where they went and where they lived and abroad. <clears throat> so, that being said, John Truman Wolf has some solutions here to these five cons. Solution one, all efforts should be made to nullify carbon credits on an immediate basis. This holds true whether on a local, national, or international basis. For example, there is a cap and trade bill in the U.S. Senate that is high on the administration's agenda. Misinformed environmentalists or, quote, environmentalists, unquote, that benefit from the carbon credit agenda are pushing this legislation with a passion. 
born of ignorance or a blatant thirst for power and wealth. Quote, this system, which may sound market-friendly, is something only a bureaucrat could dream up. The twist is that the carbon market exists only because the government's imposition of a cap creates an artificial scarcity in the right to produce energy." Unquote. That's from Deborah Corey Barnes, the Pala Report, Washington, D.C. The damaging effect of such a law in the U.S. economy or the economy of any nation that adopts similar legislation is blatantly obvious, and it should be derailed or, if already passed, repealed. California, for example, has already passed legislation that mandates a 25% cut in emissions by 2020. No one has been corny enough to brand the legislation the state's, quote, economic terminator, unquote. So I'll do it here. <clears throat> and incidentally, uh, if you want to know how California in so many ways is a microcosm of things that could happen or in some ways should happen in the rest of the 49 states of this country. Uh, I would recommend uh, listening to Jan Irving's um, video that he did uh, concerning the school system and education and the lottery in California and how every um, facet of that is a con, a deception. I highly recommend that. Uh, you can find that on Jan Irving's YouTube channel, Gnostic Media, in the playlist on the Trivium. Um, check that out. It's a real eye-opener. Okay, so two. Countries should opt out of the Kyoto Protocol and nullify it, along with any actual agreements that were made in Copenhagen. This similarly applies to all underdeveloped countries, though from a different perspective. The simplicity is that carbon credits destroy economies, environments, and life. But third world countries hold considerable leverage. If they opt out of the Kyoto Protocol and forbid carbon credits, it does not matter what laws are passed in the US or EU, the carbon credits system will fall flat. It requires developing and underdeveloped countries' cooperation as they have the carbon offset resources, rainforests, etc. It is important for them to understand that if they join the system and go for the quick buck now, they will make some short-term money selling credits, but as they gradually industrialize, they will have to buy them back. And what will the cost be then? The African Union has the capability to enforce this. 3. Biofuel production should be legislated against as it is meaningless as a viable energy resource and because it creates more environmental destruction than all prior conventional causes. Think about that. Biofuel production should be legislated against. And he's absolutely right. Four, effective action is needed to actually protect the environment reduce the use of harmful fertilizers, and gradually replace them with non-harmful products. Amen. Eliminating the production of biofuel would cause the most dramatic and immediate improvement. This would rapidly improve the condition of our rivers and oceans. Agreed. 5. De-escalate deforestation by prohibiting biofuel production, which would also bring about the most immediate environmental improvement in species preservation. It doesn't take a great deal of insight to see the amount of control any governmental body could exert over a planet, a national economy, a business, or a household by enforcing a system of carbon emission standards. This is, as one observer noted above, nothing less than complete control of the production of energy. When Gorbachev, speaking for the Club of Rome, said, quote, the threat of environmental crisis will be the internal disaster key that will unlock the new world 
order. Carbon credits are exactly the kind of New World Order he meant. Because in the final analysis, global warming is nothing more than a PR campaign for global government. We must act quickly and decisively. The Club of Rome has a massive head start and control of much of the media. But neglect of our responsibility here is not an option. Not if we value the power of choice, the freedom to produce, and economic self-determinism. Let's put this joker back in the box and keep it there. Civilization doesn't need him. And then at the end here, it has a uh, uh, about the author, John Truman Wolfe. Uh, he's the author of several award-winning fiction and non-fiction books and articles, including The Financial Crisis, A Look Behind the Wizard's Curtain, America the Litigious, Mind Games, The Gift, and his latest stunning release, Crisis by Design, the untold story of the global financial coup and what you can do about it. Shortly after the fall of communism, John made several trips to Moscow giving seminars to leading bankers and senior members of the Russian government. In recognition of his work, government officials commissioned a sculpture of his bust by the noted Russian sculptor Sergei Bikov, which was placed in the Hall of Heroes in the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Wolf has a master's degree with honors from San Jose State University and is the former chairman of the Department of History at John F. Kennedy University. Not only did John help to expose the false environmental crisis conjured up by the Club of Rome and the banksters, he has also made efforts to shed light on the very real one still ongoing. He aptly called the Gulf of Mexico oil disaster one of the biggest cover-ups in U.S. history. Hmm. So it kind of makes you wonder <clears throat> what uh, this John Truman Wolf has done and... Uh, the positions that he uh, still occupies. And, of course, he didn't go further into the heart of the matter and where this is all emanating from and the bigger picture. But whether or not he's controlled opposition or a gatekeeper, or anything else. I think we can gain valuable information from what he's saying. And I have to say that many of the points that he made, I absolutely agree with. How many people out there are saying plainly and clearly things like, um, you know, the fact that oil is not a fossil fuel. It's a renewable resource. And that's one thing they can't afford to have everybody find out about. So, that was, that was it. I just wanted to wrap up that reading and provide that extensive amount of commentary uh, beforehand because I do truly believe that... Um, the United States of America is the second beast in Revelation 13. It is enforcing all of the policies of the first beast of Revelation 13, the Holy Roman Empire. And it has made an image of that beast. And um, if the Specifically, the, um, the church, churches in the United States continue to remain silent and its shepherds uh, continue to remain bought and paid for through special government benefits via 501c3. We will continue to descend into more and more and more evil. I would not worry if I were you and I were an American. 
I would not worry about the potential disasters or evils that may come at the hands of the agents of Satan. No, no, I would not. I would worry about the judgment of a righteous God on a country who has been, for the last century, murdering worldwide, overthrowing governments, causing starvation, poverty, disease, I would worry about the judgment of a righteous and angry God. That's what I would worry about. Fear not him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can cast, after killing the body, the soul into Gehenna. Fear him who can destroy body and soul. The Almighty, Yahweh, the Father. The Father of the faithful. I have a great fear that so many in this country and in much of the world are doing as Israel did. And like we just read in 1 Corinthians 10, the things that happened to them were done by example for our admonition. So let's consider the fact that throughout much of Israel's history, they worshipped Satan, calling him God. And I worry about which God we worship. I think that's the main reason why the only true God, Yahweh, gave us his name, and it's used almost 7,000 times in the Tanakh to distinguish him from Baal, which was called Lord. I don't know how anyone can serve the true God and have faith and be a disciple of his only begotten son, Jesus, Yeshua, and do the things and allow the things that this country does at home and abroad. We need to repent. We need to repent and return to the true God through faith in his Son and genuine change. We need to work righteousness instead of iniquity. Because whatever comes upon this land through the agents of the enemy. It's nothing. They can only kill the body. But the true God can destroy the life altogether. So until next time, the the Jesus of the Bible, that Jesus is Lord. The only true God of the Bible, that God, Yahweh's kingdom, his kingdom is forever. And I'm your servant. Farewell.